É, peço desculpas, mas eu tive problemas com a conexão e acabei caindo, tá? Peço é, é, desculpas por isso. Vou tentar pela terceira vez começar. <risos> é, desculpa. É, é, então, de novo, tenho um orgulho muito grande como atual coordenador do curso de pós-graduação em Ecologia, dá então início a esse ciclo de palestras que visa então comemorar esses 45 anos do nosso programa de pós-graduação, né? É, acredito que é, nós temos, acho que, muito a, a ser comemorado, mas mais do que isso, também nós temos que pensar é, no futuro, né? E, então, eu acho que é, todo o debate aqui, é, que foi, vai ser colocado durante esses três ciclos, vai visar, visa muito isso, não só olhar para o passado, mas pensar no presente e no futuro. E eu acho que é, o que no nosso início era para é, estar abordando, então, questões ecológicas, é, por uma infeliz é, distribuição, acabou também tendo outras conotações, que eu acho que reflete muito isso que a gente está falando, né? A distribuição de gênero é, e questões etno-raciais na composição, então, desta banca. Uh, eu acho que, como eu disse, olhar para o passado e é, pensar no presente e no futuro, então eu acho que esse momento para nós foi muito importante para fazer, então, repensar sobre todas essas questões. E isso também é um reflexo do que acontece até no próximo, próprio programa, onde ao longo desses 45 anos, apenas dois anos, foi coordenado por uma professora mulher, que foi a professora Fosca. É, então, nós estamos em um momento importantíssimo de reflexões sobre a questão da diversidade e é, esta pauta foi nos colocada de uma maneira a nos abrir os olhos, o quais a, a gente acabou se equivocando, tá? Então, a, eu já gostaria até de convidá-los a todos para no próximo, no segundo ciclo de, de eventos, né, em comemoração a esses 45 anos, a gente já participar de uma nova é, ciclo de palestras, onde a diversidade, em todos os sentidos, vai ser colocada, então, é, de forma clara, a que, de forma alguma, a gente deixe pessoas, deixe é, qualquer grupo, qualquer é, questão é, político, social, no sentido sem voz, tá? tá? Então, eu gostaria muito, então, de mais uma vez, é, agradecer aos, aos, a vocês que estão nos, nos vendo, aos palestrantes, o qual o Thomas, em alguns momentos, já vai apresentar, tá? E aí a gente está dividindo essa, essa, essa palestra em três momentos, né? Então, hoje, com palestrantes internacionais que fizeram parte desses 45 anos. Então, eles têm ligações, então, desde pessoais, né, no sentido de ter feito projetos, ter participado de cursos, ter interações com os docentes e, e alunos do, do, do Congresso, do, do programa. No segundo momento, nós teremos, então, egressos e egressas do nosso curso, falando um pouquinho a respeito da conservação, um tema muito forte é, é, aqui colocado dentro da, da nossa pós-graduação. E, por fim, também teremos egressos e egressas comentando sobre essa relação cada vez mais forte entre questões evolutivas e questões, então, relacionadas à ecologia, tá? É, então, novamente, eu desejo a todos e todas é, é, um, um, um bom é, ciclo de palestras que esteja extremamente profícuo e que a gente possa, então, é, aprender e, como eu disse, é, nós da comissão já temos aí várias lições que nós aprendemos e que com certeza serão postas mais do que rapidamente é, essas lições. Então, agora também podemos falar um pouquinho de ecologia. Thomas, por favor, agradeço a sua disponibilidade de poder, então, coordenar essa mesa é, inaugural e abrilhantar um pouquinho o nosso evento, com a sua fala também, já que você faz parte é, efetivamente desse, desses 45 anos. Então, obrigado, Thomas, com você. Ah, obrigado, André. É realmente um prazer muito grande abrir esse ciclo de palestras comemorativas. Eu, ah, devido à composição do painel de hoje, eh, as nossas apresentações serão em inglês e eu vou passar para o inglês a partir de agora. Ah, I'm really pleased to be able to, to open this series of 
informal discussions to celebrate 45 years of our graduate program in, in ecology. And indeed, as I'll show you, uh, 45 years of graduate programs in ecology in Brazil in general. Um, <clears throat> I'll make a very brief uh, presentation just to give context and mention some highlights which I think are relevant to our understanding of uh, how uh, ec the ecology uh, programs got started, uh, what the, uh, some of the initial motivations and circumstances were, and then um, I'll jump quickly to the present uh, time and, uh, and introduce our today's speakers. Um, for some reason, this system doesn't like my, my sh screen sharing, so I'll have to ask uh, Andrea to please uh, put my presentation on and uh, have my first slide. André, se você puder, eu não sei se André ou Pedro que está me passando os slides, por favor. O meu PDF. Uh, the idea of this cycle is less to... Uh, of course, it's to celebrate our, our program, but it's not really to collect uh, uh, pats on the back and reciprocal congratulations on how great we are. But I think our main motivation is to see what we can learn from accomplishments, past successes and failures, and especially looking forward. Uh, so I think that the idea of the, of the series of, of discussions is uh, to collect ideas and appraisals and suggestions on how we should move forward. So I think our main, uh, it, it would be, a, I think, a bit too ambitious to say that we're planning the next 45 years, but if we, under present circumstances, if we're able to think five years ahead or 10, that's already great. So um, as Andrea Garrafone, uh uh, already said that today's speakers were selected for a particular reason, which uh, at the end of this this presentation, I'll I'll, I'll be, be glad to to expect and to to explain to you to show you. So we're celebrating these forty five years. Uh, next, please, Rosmi. I want to give you a little bit of context of the circumstances in which these, these programs appeared. First of all, um, universities in Brazil, especially the, the modern concept of a university, are fairly recent even compared to other Latin American countries. Uh, we can use as one landmark founding of the University of Sao Paulo, which uh, brought in a number of foreign researchers to start uh, uh, to start departments and start research groups in a number of strategic areas. This in the 40s, one of the main inputs to this uh, uh, were a number of visits, which uh, some of them were quite private, others were sponsored by, for instance, the, uh, the Rockefeller Foundation, who were brought Theodosius Dobzhansky to Brazil on a number of years. And Dobzhansky, of course, helped to jumpstart genetics in Brazil, modern genetics, that is. But he also was very influential in starting in putting some ecological questions, uh, which would be carried on by Brazilian researchers, junior researchers who were associated with him. I also would like to mention ha Harold Sioli, who got here briefly before the Second World War, and then he got trapped here as a German, uh, as a, a hostile alien, and uh, so he spent several years studying in the Amazon, and that was the basis for, uh, for a long collaboration with the Max Planck Institute, which uh, I'll, I'll come back to briefly later. In the 50s, the two main funding agencies were founded, CAPES and CNPQ in Brazil, research uh, funding agencies, and uh, also the, the, the Amazonian Research Institute, INPA, was founded. 
interestingly, ecology was among it was on its initial uh, agenda, but uh, it took more than 20 years before INPA actually had a first, had a, a, a actual, an actual ecology sector. In the 60s, we, uh, we have the founding of the Brasilia, of the National University in Brasilia, which was the first uh, uh, university which in its charter uh, planned on having undergraduate and graduate studies. This was a quite contemporary design. Unfortunately, it didn't last long because we had the military coup in 1964 and the university was, was virtually dismantled. So we lost this initial uh, possibility of a contemporary integration of undergraduate and graduate programs. Also at that time, uh, the, the military, uh, <coughs> decided to occupy uh, demographically and economically the, the Amazon and the Trans, uh, the Trans Amazon Highway was started. Prosum, next please. So in the 70s, uh, our landmarks here are that, that uh, CAPES uh, designs a national graduate program and normalizes graduate programs for most universities which is when we get started. At the same time, the environment becomes more uh, conspicuous. We have, there's the, the 1972 Stockholm Conference, uh, in which uh, uh, a military, a high-ranking military representing the Brazilian government, uh, made the memorable statement that if pollution is the price that you pay for development, let's pollute as fast as we can. Um, so, uh, in this, in these circumstances, uh, the first graduate programs in, in, in ecology in Brazil got started. Uh, even though the military had this strong uh, development program, especially for the Amazon, in the 80s, in the early 80s, the, the first National Institute of the Environment was founded. And then we had a transition to a civilian government, a new constitution, which had a very strong chapter on the environment. And that was followed, of course, by uh, Brazil hosting the Rio 92 uh, Biological Diversity Convention and the Ministry of the Environment was actually founded. So these are the, more or less, this is a very sketchy background to the setting where uh, the first graduate programs in ecology uh, get started. Uh, so the first four programs started in Brazil were in Impa in the, in the Amazon, São Carlos, in uh, the state of Sao Paulo with a focus on limnology. The University of Brasilia started one with a strong focus on Cerrado and Unicamp started a program with population and evolution, focused on population and evolutionary ecology. Uh, what is striking, what you can see at once, is that the, 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 the INPA, Sao Carlos and Brasilia programs were focused on a particularly, on a particular biome whereas Unicamp was not focused on one biome, but on a more abstract or theoretical uh, framework. Uh, <clears throat> I'm just citing here quickly some key names uh, for each program to show that, in fact, each of these four programs was started by a very small uh, core of uh, leaders. And in the case of, of uh, Unicamp, these three gringos were recruited specifically to start the ecology program, uh, Woody Benson uh, and Keith Brown retired, Ed Willis who moved uh, to the State University, in, uh, to the Sao Paulo State University in, in, in Rio Claro and who passed away a few years ago. So these three uh, American ecologists uh, more or less designed the theoretical base of the, the first courses which every master's student was supposed to take. 
uh, doctoral programs were only started uh, four years later. Uh, next slide, please. Prossimo. In plant ecology, our first uh, lead lecturers were Hermogenes Leiton Filho, uh, shown here uh, sampling uh, Xylopia aromatic in our first uh, field course in the Serrada in 1977. And Peter Gibbs, uh, noted pollination ecologist, who's, uh, who chaired the botany department for several years and kept contact, uh, he returned to, uh, to Scotland afterwards, but he kept contact and kept tutoring Brazilian, uh, Brazilian ecologists for many years after, after as well. Uh, these are just a few names. Of course, there were other key figures in the, in the following years, but uh, these were the persons who are responsible for the, for the design of the, of the program and, and uh, giving it its first uh, uh, its first character. I'm not going to go into details here, I just want to mention one particular um, point. Uh, next slide, please. Field courses were a key feature of the, of the graduate program, uh, of the Unicamp graduate program. In fact, uh, for several years, all master's students had to take two field courses, one in, in, in for, uh, a forest, one which was uh, for the first years was in the Amazon, then it moved to Atlantic Forest, and a Cerrado course. They had two, they were strikingly different, and uh, in combination, they gave students a quite broad background into two very different approaches to, to ecology. Uh, the forest course was designed based on the Organization of Tropical Studies courses in, in, in Costa Rica, and it was uh, centered on developing short research projects on particular questions. Whereas the Cerrado course uh, trained students in phytosociological methods, of course, they had also to develop individual projects and were free to do this in whatever sub, uh, theme they were interested in. But uh, so this, I think, was one of the, 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 the key uh, features of our, of our program. And it was, in fact, adopted by a number of other graduate uh, programs uh, in ecology. And limitation to this, of course, is the cost of taking students out to the field and the logistics uh, have become heavier and the economics as well more and more difficult, but still uh, field courses are uh, uh, a main feature of the UNICAMP and especially of, of several other uh, graduate programs in ecology. So I, I want to briefly mention two moments uh, that I think also helped to, to uh, uh, characterize what happened at Unicamp and how quickly uh, the, the graduate program helped to, let's say, jumpstart an extensive uh, array of research uh, projects in a number of fields in different places. In 1988, uh, in UNICAMP, we hosted a symposium, an in international symposium on uh, plant-animal interactions, and we brought a surprising number of leading, uh, world-class leading ecologists uh, who include, uh, uh, in this picture, Bob Marquis, uh, Doug Futuma, Sam McNaughton, uh, and so on. And uh, we had about 330 at attending, uh, mostly young students from all over Brazil. And if we look over the list of, of uh, attendants, we see that they permeated in the following years, these, uh, they, they permeated most of, uh, of uh, uh, Brazilian research institutions and universities. So, próximo favor. And uh, this resulted in a, uh, in, a, in a book published in 1991, which also has helped to establish uh, Brazilian ecology on an international scene, giving it international visibility. Of course, this was not the only such event, 
this a number of other similar events took place in the following years and helped to set uh, Brazil on the international scene crossing. Another event I'd like to highlight uh, took place uh, 30 years later, uh, no, yes, uh, 20, 20 odd years later, uh, when uh, an advanced school on ecological networks was held in, in, uh, in Sao Paulo. And this had an equal mixture in, uh, of Brazilian and uh, foreign, both lecturers and students. And this goes to show that by that time we had a really mature development in standing, I would say. Uh, this, this was quite a, 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 a quite successful and productive event, and it goes to show that from 76 until 2010-11, we had moved uh, a long way, and uh, I think that this is one of the themes that our, that our today's speakers will develop uh, 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 more So there are two, two uh, final points I want to make before presenting our speakers. In uh, 15 years ago, when we celebrated the 30th uh, uh, anniversary of, the, of our graduate program, we had this map showing uh, just a list, an, actually an incomplete list of universities in Brazil where, where alumni or alumni of, uh, of Unicamp were lecturing or taking part in graduate programs. And I'm happy to say that any attempt of, of making a similar map for 2021 would be uh, pointless because by now we have a much more complex network. We have alumni from many other places permeating all other universities, which is as it should be. So uh, by now a number of other programs are well established and uh, are producing excellent science and similar standing and my final slide here Prosmo, as a very simple comparison in 2007 when we were celebrating uh, the 30th anniversary we had 22 programs awarding phds in ecology in brazil three of them were top rated by by CAPES, which ranks graduate programs and uh, 2017, which is the last available assessment, the current one has been suspended by the current government. Uh, we don't know if it's, if it's going to happen or not. But anyway, so the latest data, we have at least 44 programs. This is a bit fuzzy because uh, given the names of the programs, some biodiversity programs are basically taxonomy programs, others are ecology. So. I would say that these 40, 44 is a minimum number of programs which actually are fostering ecology in Brazil, but a surprisingly high number of these have been rated as top rated by CAPES, which just goes to show that we are, uh, we now have a broad base, uh, geographically spread base of, of centers of production of ecological research and and new scientists. So, last slide. Próximo. So, now what? Now what? We could celebrate our accomplishments and maybe uh, Unicamp should retire to a comfortable role of a uh, living fossil in this history of, of uh, ecological research. I don't think we're quite ready to do that. I think we're more interested in thinking, looking forward, as I said before, and thinking, uh, where do we go now? Uh, the, the key question here is, is the, I think the key challenge is not how do we, uh, what kind of research do we produce, because uh, leaving all modesty aside, I think there's no, that there is, there are a number of, of people at, in Unicamp as well and other programs producing uh, research of a high quality. The key challenge is how do we help young ecologists to, to become better or equip them better for the future? This is certainly not by repeating the past. Too many things are, are happening. The urgency of new research is, is tremendous. The challenges of doing uh, research in environmental 
uh, environmental research in Brazil nowadays is huge. I won't go into details on, on this, but it's especially difficult, uh, become especially difficult in the last few years under the present government, who, which, uh, which is, has an, a, a, a clear policy, an anti-environmental and uh, uh, a policy, an anti-science policy, so it's become more and more difficult, but apart from these few years which hopefully will be overcome in the new future, still the question is uh, how do we, what how can a graduate program better prepare, better equip scientists for what they're going to face in the next 10, 15 years? So this is a question that I'm sharing with the present panel and the, the panels of the next discussions to come. And it's my great pleasure, Prosmo, to introduce the speakers. Uh, next slide, please. Here. So, our panel today was selected on the basis of their connection to Brazilian ecology, and particularly to, to, to Unicamp. Uh, Wolfgang Weisse is, I mean, in going in, in uh, starting with Wolfgang, Wolfgang uh, actually had his first contact with Unicamp as an undergraduate student in, in a German university, and he came to a to 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 any uh, to any camp at that time, and he made a number of strong personal and professional connections, which last to this day, and have led to a number of collaborations, including with myself, but many other Brazilians, in Unicamp and in other places. Uh, this has been a pleasant and quite productive exchange, and hopefully an ongoing one. Pedro Hordano has frequented Brazil regularly for at least 20 years. He's going to mention this, and he's almost entitled to honorary Brazilian citizenship by now. He's, he's taught a number of courses in, in uh, collaboration with Brazilian and other and scientists from other, from, from other countries. And uh, I had the pleasure of meeting him in Brazil in, at Unicamp uh, about 20 years ago, I think. And again, since then, we've been seeing and collaborating uh, regularly, enjoying each other's company in, in various ways, uh, including gastronomical. And Diane, uh, Sri Gustava, Diane, I had the, the, the pleasure of meeting her when she was finishing, no, when she's ac actually when she was starting on a field research for a PhD at Imperial College in, in, uh, in the UK. And uh, she has had uh, uh, an ongoing, a growing collaboration with a number of Brazilian scientists for several years. So these three uh, are in a unique position of making a personal, presenting a personal view of what, how they see Brazilian ecology, how it is collaborating with it, and making uh, suggestions that hopefully will enrich the discussion that, uh, that we all hope to have here. So with this, I would invite Wolfgang Weiss to start to, to give his presentation and we will collect questions for discussion at the end of the three talks. Uh, by, by way of chat, uh, questions can be put in whatever language except Chinese. I don't think any of us speaks Chinese, but Portuguese, Spanish, or, or, or English, and translated as necessary. So thank you very much. Thank all the speakers and thank uh, people who are attending this, this discussion. And Wolfgang, you have the, the microphone. Okay. Thank you very much, Thomas, for your introduction. What I would like to share is really some personal impressions from um, my past cooperations with the Brazil and my contact to the ecology programs. Um, Thomas wasn't particularly specific about what we should present. So maybe um, I miss a little bit the topic, but nevertheless, I, I'm deeply impressed by the 
ecology program in at Unicampe, but also elsewhere. And this is what I would like to share. So let me go. So my first contact, um, my first contact, ah, so why is it not progressing? My first contact to Brazil was the visit of Thomas to the University of Bayreuth. So um, he uh, was visiting my supervisor at the time, Helmut Zwölver. I was specializing in ecology at the University of Bayreuth. And the University of Bayreuth is a very small university um, in the, well, now it's sort of in the center of Germany, but at that time it was in the very far east of Bavaria. To the north, you can see was the German Democratic Republic with a border that you could not cross. And on the, in the east, there was Czechoslovakia at the time with a border that you cannot cross. So actually it was quite an isolated area and um, the university was founded there in the 1970s to really in, uh, uh, sort of bring life back to these, um, to these regions that are very close to these borders. But it did have a number of ecologists among whom was Helmut Zwölver, who, as I said, worked on flower heads of Asteraceae, and that was uh, what Thomas was interested in. So he was there. He was also in some of the courses. At, at some stage, I took all my courage and asked him, well, I have to do a practical abroad. Um, would it be possible to come to Brazil for a short while? And to my great pleasure, he said yes. And this is how I then went to um, Unicampe in uh, uh in the, yeah, in 1989. Now at that time in, ecolo uh, in Germany, ecology um, was had a number of strong um, areas and a number of fields where it wasn't so strong. And uh, one can really say that ecology was overall not very present at university. So I studied biology and I particularly um, chose to go to Bayreuth because that was the only university I found that had both plant ecology and animal ecology um, at the basic level. That just shows you how, how little ecology we had at that time. Germany was strong at ecophysiology at that time. Um, uh, Ernst Detlef Schulze and Lange are some names. It was strong in vegetation science, uh, particularly phytosociology. There was some tradition in tropical ecology and it was strong in plant nutrition. Um, and then on the animal side, there was a very strong group or groups working in neurobiology and the physiological ecology of insects, of beds and uh, of birds. So both on the plant side and the animal side, ecology was largely um, physiological ecology, whereas community ecology was basically not really existent. And Helmut Zwölver was one of the um, exceptions. So when I then arrived at Unicampe, um, it was uh, for me coming from a very small university with being very isolated with very little contact to the rest of the world. Um, I came to a university that uh, was at the other end of the world, but I had the feeling I'm now in a center for ecology. I noticed that there can be an ecology program where people really have courses across the whole range of ecology. I noticed that people actually read a lot. So the ecology program worked in contrast to what I was used to Germany with uh, people reading papers. And um, this may sound strange today, but um, uh, it, it was a very big difference. There was a lot of discussion among students and professors, which is, was also very different from what I was used in Germany, used to because there, there was a very strong hierarchy level. And I was very impressed by the students that are all very good. Um, and many of the people actually I met there um, are now professors somewhere in Brazil or elsewhere. And I've given a few names at the bottom and I'm sure that I, 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 did, I did not list all of them. 
I also noticed to my surprise that not all Brazilians like football. And something I also noticed was that the master thesis were very long. So at that time, four years or five years even was very long, which meant that the master's program was extremely long. This has changed, but at that time it was, was quite striking. And again, a very big difference to what we had in Germany, but there it was about one year, but could also be a little bit longer. So um, I was very happy being integrated among the students. Some people played handball, so we took part in one of these competitions. And you may recognize some of your Brazilian colleagues there. Um, and um, it was, was a lot of fun. Interestingly, while I was there, um, the wall came down. So all these pictures I only saw from Brazil. And I still remember that a few days after I after the wall came down, you could already buy pieces from the Berlin Wall in Campinas. And I wasn't quite sure if they were real pieces of, of the wall. Now, when I then continued with the PhD, I, um, I, I still made this, um, I still have this experience that uh, there were quite a few Brazilians doing, I was in England at the time, um, that there are quite a few very good students that have come from the ecology programs in Brazil. They do their PhD abroad. And, and what was also very different from to what I was used to was that there's the strong combination of both theoretical and empirical work, which was also then a part of the PhD thesis, but which they had also learned um, at the time in the universities. Um, I also joined the Brazilian society at the time, so I still have some friends from that time. And um, since I then progressed as a postdoc and so on, I got to know more and more people in Brazil. And um, I have to say that I am still very impressed by the quality of the ecology programs in Brazil. They are all over the place. Um, there are lots of very, very good teachers. So students are very lucky to have um, such teachers, I think. And the Brazilian field course is something I took part in only one so far and also only for a few days. But I think that is a very good invention and something where other, uh, other um, countries can also learn something. But generally, as I said, I, I'm very impressed. I had, a, I, I still have a lot of contact to Natal, and um, they have a very good ecology program. They have recruited a lot of good people. So the situation in ecology in Brazil is actually very impressive, I have to say. And I think it's worldwide recognized that Brazil is one of the top countries in the world. And this ranges uh, from theoretical work to to application and a lot of community ecology, of course. And um, the experience in teaching that people um, uh, yeah, have, for example, resulted in one of the papers, uh, uh, papers on teaching ecology led by Thomas, which I think is also in a way an outcome of the ecology programs. And yeah, I don't want to talk about a lot of the research I'm doing with people in Brazil. Sometimes it's rather strange review. Uh, so this is some theoretical analysis by Marcio Cardoso about uh, the likelihood of a country becoming world champion in the football um, competition. For some reason, I never quite understood this analysis, but he came out with the, that the probability of winning for Brazil is, is higher than the probability of winning in Germany. Now in Germany, of course, we like to remember some other event, especially now as our team is not so good. So today in Germany, um, ecology is much more present than it was when I was a student. So it's present in many universities. Many of the universities offer specialized degrees, the master of College New Biodiversity, for example, in Göttingen. There's now much more of community ecology. There's a lot of biodiversity ecosystem functioning research, uh, also larger projects where people cooperate. On the, theoretic, on the theoretical side, I think uh, Germany is still not so brilliant. And um, so there, there we would also need some impact. 
and um, and this, for example, I I, I see in Brazil um, that this is there. So what I learned and what I think Germany can learn to end my short presentation is that a dedicated ecology program can be extremely useful in forming students. Um, we do have ecology programs in Germany now, but we don't really have um, a lot of them, even though they, they do occur here and there. Often they are combined with some applied research, for example, in my university. I also learned in Brazil where teachers have done their PhD elsewhere or have very close contact elsewhere, that it's very useful to look beyond national programs. So I don't think the ecology program in Brazil is a copy of the American eco ecology programs. I think it's a true Brazilian program which took elements from all over the world. And this is what I think in Germany we can also still learn from. I like the field courses. I already said so. I probably would combine them a little bit more with the maybe more German tradition of getting to know species where you go out and you do taxonomy and you uh, really get to know some of the species. I know you have a mega diverse fauna, but still I think it's possible to learn some of the species. And I also learned that um, good research in the climate of funding uncertainty is of course not easy, but it's possible. So, so I think that's also something um, that but one should uh, yeah, acknowledge and admire that that uh, even in, in today's times when it's so difficult, people do very, very good research. So I do think that um, Brazilian ecology programs are still a very good role model for ecology programs worldwide. From my personal perspective, having seen them in more detail in the US, in Germany, in England, but um, I think in general, um, they're very good and Unicampe certainly is one of the founders and um, yeah, has influenced a lot of them. So thank you very much. Thank you, Wolfgang. Uh, you may not have gotten any instructions on what to talk about, but I think that you got very close to the spirit of what we intended. And as I said, at first we will keep questions to the end and I would like to move immediately to Pedro Hordano and ask him to, to uh, for his presentation. So, Pedro. Okay. Thank you very much, Toma. I'd like to share my screen. Is it working? Sorry, I think I lost the... Professor, it was working. Okay. You, it was all working. It's okay now. All good. All good. You can you can carry on. Okay. But boa tarde, casi noite aqui na na Espanha. Para mim é, é um prazer, é um privilégio também poder participar neste encontro comemorando o aniversário da pós-graduação em ecologia da Unicamp. É, feliz aniversário, happy birthday. É, também uma oportunidade única para apresentar para vocês uma visão muito pessoal de uma série de reflexões motivadas por as colaborações que eu já tive aqui com eh, equipes de, de pesquisa aqui no, no, no Brasil que começaram até 21 anos atrás. Então vai ser como uma visão muito pessoal 
eh, tomando algunos ejemplos con eh, diferentes líneas de pesquisa que ya fiz. Eh, también hay un análisis de la perspectiva de la ecología brasileira como yo, yo contemplo ahora eh, la situación. Eh, I'll turn to English now. Uh, so my talk is, uh, I plan to divide today my talk in three parts. The first one, giving you a brief overview of my, my personal background in Brazil for the last 21 years of collaboration with different, with different teams, as uh, Thomas already uh, presented. Then in a second part, I'll give you a, a very brief analysis of of based on recent bibliometric analysis of Brazilian scientific production of what is for me the perspective of, of Brazilian ecological research. And then I'll finish with three very brief ingredients, so to speak, of about the future. What do we need to take into account uh, about the future? Okay, so just to introduce you a little bit, I'm. Uh, here in beautiful Sevilla city in Southern Spain. And those are my mainly field work since uh, I started my career, basically in Mediterranean, Southern Spain, but then extending to other places here. And then more recently uh, doing some work in the Canary Island also. But before that, 21 years ago in 2000, I, I did my first trip to, to Brazil together with uh, Mauro Galetti and Marco Aurelio Piso, uh, that together with Paulo Guimaraes from USP, uh, have been my main collaborators in, in, in Brazil. But also, as you will see, I've uh, collaborated also a lot with uh, people from Unicampi and from other universities, from, from Sao Carlos and so on. But basically, <clears throat> all my activities in Brazil and my collaborations have been focusing in Sao Paulo, with a brief research also in Southern Pantanal here. And so 21 years ago, here I am with a bit more, more head on my head and also uh, less biomass. And we are here in Saibadela in 2000. And that was a, a stay of about one week together with uh, Mauro and Mauro Galetti and Marco Aurelio Pizzo and so, <clears throat> sorry some students and we just started to think together about about potential collaborations to develop in the, the in 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 more years in the in the future years to come um, so this is the the first the the first stay and from there my main collaborations have been pivoting pivoting around uh, institutions like UNESP especially La Vic in in Rio Claro uh, USP in Sao, in Sao Paulo, and of course, uh, of course, UNICAM with different different research research group, and especially with with Thomas. And um, most of our research lines started by focusing on seed dispersal by frugivorous animals, studying mutualistic interactions there. And we take the opportunity that both uh, Mauro and Marco Aurelio were at that time just with the PhD um, completed and I started new projects focusing uh, mostly on seed dispersal by animal frugivores. Uh, so those were really the first stages. These unfolded uh, to a broader approach to different types of plant animal interactions, but still, still focusing a lot on seed dispersal uh, by animal. But, but then uh, especially with Paulo Guimaraes, another external collaboration like Professor John Thompson from University of, San, uh, of California, Santa Cruz. We were interested in applying all those empirical data and empirical knowledge base to uh, studies of co-evolution. Um, and that, on top of that, uh, we also uh, developed, developed a lot of uh, initial background in com complex ecological network networks. What uh, do multi-specific assemblage of, of species and the interactions that they have uh, have in common with uh, with uh, other com complex systems? And then uh, an important aspect of the research that I learned a lot 
and broadening my own uh, research lines in, in my scientific career was the interest in, in the, the effects of defaunation and uh, forest fragmentation in terms of conservation biology and the conservation of ecological interactions. And so th during those 21 years, I've been collaborating mainly with UNESPI in Rio Claro, uh, both with the, with the graduate, graduate and postgraduate courses, the postgraduate SAO in Ecologia e Biologia da Conservação, where uh, I've been teaching as a professor within the Ciencias Sem Fronteras program. And I've been involved in more than five projects led by different UNESCO professors, including Mauro Galetti, Marco Aurelio Piso, Marina Correa, and Milton Ribeiro. And also I participated in, in courses in UNICAM, in the postgraduate program of UNICAM as an inviter, invited professor for uh, doing seminars and, and um, assessing students and helping uh, in different projects, different ongoing projects. So, so uh, during during all those many years, I supervised directly three PhD students, among them Paulo Guimaraes and others, and co-supervised five additional PhD projects. And I also supervised directly four master students and co-supervised more than ten, and many more than thirty. Uh, assessment on supporting supervisions for masters, uh, students, and stu students involved in Inicia Sao de Pesquisa, in projects of Inicia Sao de Pesquisa. So, so those are the, the main uh, background. The, and all my research program pivots on the importance of ecological interactions, especially plant animal mutualisms. Uh, for the conservation of uh, tropical rainforest and Mediterranean rainforest. So my Brazilian collaborations have influenced tremendously my way of thinking about this very, very general theme and pivoting around four main points that are outlined here. The evolutionary ecology of plant animal mutualisms, the dispersal processes in plant populations, including both pollination and seed dispersal mediated by animal, the effects of extinction of ecological interactions. So that has been a very important, and I got a lot of insight and inspiration about with my collaboration here in Brazil to, to broaden my, my, uh, my personal approaches to more oriented conservation biology. And then of course, to the study of complex ecological networks that uh, moving for, from pairwise interactions to the complexity of a mega diverse interactions in highly complex systems, like uh, for instance, these uh, networks of interaction between frugivorous animals and fleshy fruited plants studied by uh, Wesley, Professor Wesley Silva from Unicampi that have been a collaborator for years, uh, nicely shows all those complexity, what are the implication, not only of the specific species that we may find here, of the frugivorous animals or the fleshy fruited plants, but also of the tremendous diversity of those interactions. What is behind all this complexity? What are the natural history details that support the functional outcomes of all these myriad of interactions? So, we have approached this problem in the scenario of the Mata Atlantica, the Atlantic forest in, in Brazil, uh, in particular to assess how important is the extinction of those interactions, not, not only the loss of species, but the extinction of interactions in problems that we must solve, like the, the recovery of the remnant uh, Atlantic, uh, Atlantic forest that is now only a uh, 12% remnant forest and most of it, more than 80% of it, uh, uh, isolated in, in, in patches of less than 50 hectares. And what are the consequences of losing all those interactions in terms of losing also a key ecological, key ecosystem processes like the, the potential for carbon storage uh, in, in those forests. Those uh, have been research lines that have been fundamental to my, to my own development, in, in my, to the development of my own scientific career. I, 
I, I, I like very much to highlight this specific study where we addressed the, the seed dispersal uh, anachronisms, the, pro the problem of, of seed dispersal adaptations that, that, are, that actually do not function in the forest uh, adequately for forest recovery. So 13 years ago, together with Mauro Galetti and Paolo Guimaraes, we started to rethinking uh, all those uh, fruit, fruits, fleshy fruit that extinct megafauna ate. And I use this, this particular example to highlight, to highlight the broadening in my personal research career and my personal understanding of ecological interactions that all my collab collaboration with, uh, with uh, Brazilian researchers uh, has represented. I really appreciate that. Uh, a lot. So we are using now in collaboration with Matias Pires, now professor at Unicampi, we are using those type of functional model, models based, based on allometric relationship, relationships between body mass, gut capacity, uh, gut retention time, day range, to model the functional, to infer the functional role that sting megafauna uh, have in, in, this, uh, in this ecosystem. So this is the megafauna team and I really appreciate all the inspiration that those guys in the megafauna team ha has represent, I, are, uh, have represented to my career. And we, we certainly, we, we still keep in doing uh, richer research along those lines. Then all those, all, all, uh, all those collaborations also have inspired not only not only a research line, not only uh, writing papers in collaboration, but also uh, field courses like the field course in Frugivoria uh, uh, Dispersada Cementes that was supported both by UNESPI and UNICAMPI. And uh, this course uh, had been running for uh, now uh, almost uh, 18 years now with, uh, we have already completed 14, if I remember well, 14 editions of the of the field course on frugivory and seed dispersal, um, and all uh, also these co co the collaborations with the uh, postgraduate programs, both of UNESPI and, and Unicampi, and that has been uh, really a, 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 a granary for master thesis, for PhD projects, for stays abroad, for extended collaborations starting many years ago with a very small group of people. And um, uh, here, for instance, you can see uh, uh, Marco Aurelio Pizzo, and then this is me, and this is in Isla do Cardoso. And then in more recent year, more courses in, in 2004, also with uh, Mauro and Marco Aurelio, and Wesley Silva has to be there, if not, taking the photo and then other uh, professor, external professors here in the course. So here is uh, Professor Professor Wesley and other people like Rodolfo Dirzo, Jose Maria Gomez from Spain and other invited professor like uh, Alexandra Pires, uh, Marina Cortez uh, and so on. And here Paulo Guimaraes, of course, uh, Marco Melo and, and other people collaborating in this field course that, that have been a great success. And that also, as, as Thomas uh, uh, presented, is just a continuation of the tradition of field courses that have a strong empirical background of experimental research in the forest, but then broadening all that and not getting trapped just in the natural history details, but being able to do also a hypothetical deductive ecology that brings together uh, uh, all those and uh, all this uh, research to uh, broader aspects. Um, so in terms of Brazilian ecologi ecological research, there are many different interesting research lines that are now championed by Brazilian researchers. Here uh, I've been highlighting different uh, research lines who are, in my humble uh, opinion, 
uh, are really uh, very important and where Brazilian researchers uh, are really uh, located in the in the front front end in the in the top line at the uh, with a very high visibility in a in a world scale level like plant animal interactions in general the ecology and conservation biology of plant animal interactions all the field of macroecology is impressive what brazilian researchers are contributing in the area of macroecology evolutionary ecology theoretical ecology restoration ecology with uh, several groups that, that are doing really highly innovative uh, aspects in, in in the in the research of restoration ecology population ecology demogenetics using new molecular approaches to understand dispersal processes colonization of new habitats and so on and of course community ecology and paleoecology and all those i've been witnessing during those 21 years at tremendous increase in the publication record of Brazilian ecological re researcher. Uh, Brazil ranked 13th with, uh, with more than uh, 250,000 publications among countries with the high, highest research productivity, uh, corresponding to uh, more than 10% of the scientific production of very, very large countries. And uh, more importantly, publications, scientific papers in Brazil have increased by 30%, twice the global mean. Over 50,000 articles published in 2018, just in 2018. And the total number of papers in the top journals, multidisciplinary journals like Nature and Science, have increased, increased by several orders of magnitude between 1918 and, 19, uh, and 2017. So this is really a tremendous, a tremendous advance. But then, quite interestingly, if we compare to other areas with this, as reported by different, uh, more or less recent bibliometric analysis, like especially the Clarivate Analytics Report for CAPES Foundation, when we compare to the to other scientific areas in the Brazilian community, in the Brazilian scientific academic field, we see that the tremendous increase that has been uh, seen by researching environmental uh, sciences and especially ecology with a growing number of documents by 62.8%, uh, that is, uh, comparable to materials of science and computer science and well above, above all the rest of scientific disciplines in Brazil. But this is, it is very interesting because ecological researchers in Brazil have not been especially productive. So in terms of scientific papers published, they, they rank here almost at the end of the distribution regarding the number of papers here in, 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 in blue, in papers published, according to the Clarivate report. But then what is interesting is that together with astronomy and astrophysics and physics, uh, uh, particle physics and, and uh, physics of fields, together with them, ecology is above the worldwide mean in terms of scientific impact. So despite our relatively it reduced compared to other scientific areas in, in the Brazilian academic scientific community, uh, eco ecological research in Brazil really has a, sign a highly significant uh, impact and, and citation rate in, in, in the world. So here we have again ecology in Brazil with a relatively reduced number of paper with more than 4,400 for the period of 2011-2016, and with a citation, re relative citation impact to the world world average above one, and then with a very very high percent of, of top ranked papers, and also a very interesting aspect is the internal internationalization that is comparable to that seen in in other uh, sorry.
that's seen in other uh, areas like uh, astronomy and astrophysics and physics. So here, with more than 50% of the paper published in collaboration. That is very interesting because the uh, international collaboration, the percentage of articles with international co-authorship in Brazil uh, is, is not very high, and, uh, but it stands quite close in quite close comparison to, to European countries like uh, Spain or uh, uh, Germany or United Kingdom, and also uh, Argentina has decreased until uh, 2012. But then, if we see the comparison with other Latin American countries, we see we see here the profile of uh, the Brazilian uh, um, overall science production in terms of percent international collaboration, and this it is steeply increasing, but um, still below 50%, but then with a distinct pattern compared to other Latin American countries. That means, that is not bad. That means a, 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 a very high level of autonomous research conducted in Brazil, and this is a very positive, that is a very positive aspect of Brazilian research. So it's not just, it's not just having science developed by external collaboration also reveals a, 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 a very good level of maturity of the scientific academic community in the country. And of course, international collaboration is of course a, a one thing that need to be that, that needs to be a, to, to be um, um, incentivized. Uh, so uh, yeah, just to finish my presentation, three main ingred ingredients for the future: funding, and that is a real problem, not only in Brazil, but also here in Spain, and even in the European, in, 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 in the European Union. Uh, for instance, the, the European Research Council has seen recently uh, some shortcuts of, of the funding level received. But then in Brazil, certainly the, the situation is, is uh, quite problematic because with the, with the recent Bolsonaro uh, government is uh, close to collapse. So, so, so um, we need to, 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 to move and to put pressure to reinvigorate the, the funding levels for Brazilian science. Uh, and that is fundamental to establish a, an, a, an, a very high robustness of the academic institution in a country. And a robust science, a robust uh, science and a robust academic institution in a country are fundamental for, for a well-developed democracy. Science is an essential part of a, a democratic, democratic country. Um, their international collaboration will be fundamental to solid, solidify, to, to add robustness to that already uh, demonstrated uh, in autonomy, uh, the, the high degree of autonomy of research that Bra the Brazil has as, as, a, as a country, and also in terms of ecological research, that would be fundamental to, to, to increase and to boost that trend for uh, not just simply increasing publication and increasing number of paper published, but increasing also the influence of all those uh, research lines, all those research results in the international uh, academic community. So thank you very much, very especially to the institution that over the years have supported my collaboration with Brazil, in particular uh, UNICAMP, of course, and uh, UNESPI and University of Sao Paulo, and very especially FAPESPI and, of course, CAPES through, through the uh, Ciencias Sem Fronteras program. Thank you very much. Thank you, Pedro, for this really illuminating uh, presentation. I think that, again, this gives us uh, a lot of food for thought. And before we start discussion, of course, uh, uh, I would like to, to, to ask Diane Silvastava to complete our roast of presentations today. So, Diane, please, if you would like to take over. Hi. 
just give me a second and I will pick the right window to share. Okay, um, hi, and uh, thanks for inviting me to talk today. Um, I have to say when Thomas reached out to me to talk, I, I was a little flummoxed what I was going to talk about. Um, you know, I have been in and out of Unicampi for uh, over the years. I have um, uh, collaborated with, um, I reckon, uh, four different Unicamp uh, faculty members, um, all of whom will make cameos in my talk today. Um, but I'm not an expert on Unicamp. So I was like pulling my hair out, like, what am I going to talk about? Um, you know, the audience is the expert on Unicamp, not me. Um, but I thought maybe actually the story that I could tell is the story of how we built an international network. And it kind of follows uh, quite nicely from Pedro's uh, final comments on international collaboration. And I'm hoping that what I'm going to say today will be of use to researchers at UNICAB, especially early career researchers um, who are thinking about starting international collaborations, thinking about um, what the benefits might be, um, thinking perhaps what they should expect if they start collaborating with international researchers um, and how to go about it. So, so I'm going to tell you a story today. And like all good stories in ecology, this one starts with Thomas. Um, so as Thomas mentioned uh, about an hour ago, um, I met... Diane, yes. uh, sorry to interrupt, but the presentation is in full screen. I don't know if you notice or if it's... It is not full screen. Not yet. Okay. Uh, sometimes PowerPoint has this problem that when you present only the... Yeah. The, the window, the, the full screen doesn't work. But it's still not full screen, only showing the, the slide normally. And that is also not full screen? Not full screen, not yet. Let's try a different way to... Uh... And this? Uh, not full screen yet. <laughs> I, think you, I think you have to share the, your whole screen, not only the oh, I PowerPoint. See. Yeah, okay. PowerPoint has the same issue with Google Meet sometimes, so it's, it's really okay. annoying. Yeah. Do you see it entirely now? Now it's all good. You can carry on. Okay, great. Okay, so where were we? Um, right, it was the mid '90s, and I was uh, at the start of my PhD, and I was um, I was in a pickle. I I didn't know uh, I'd started off in so many different research directions. I didn't know what I should keep going with and what I should cut and how to manage it all. And um, Thomas had some wise words for me that uh, I think made a big impact on the direction of my PhD. But, um, you know, I bet, I think talking to him, he, he doesn't really remember what exactly he said then. Um, uh, but that's fine. It, it made an impact. Um, so that was the mid-90s. For about a decade, that was my only contact uh, with Unicampe. I went off to Costa Rica and I started developing a research program on the aquatic insect food webs within bromeliads. Um, developing this as a model system for ecology. Um, but because of that work, I guess, um, I was contacted uh, just before 2008 by Gustavo Romero. Um, and Gustavo had been working not with water-filled bromeliads, but with terrestrial bromeliads, dry bromeliads. And uh, he was interested in taking some of those ideas about how spiders affected uh, bromeliad nutrition and thinking about them with aquatic bromeliads. So he invited me. Uh, it actually, I was um, 
on sabbatical in Argentina at the time. So it worked out uh, very conveniently that I could go to Ilia de Cordoso for uh, a month in 2008 to do these experiments. Um, and at the same time, I went to Rio and met up with uh, Vinicius Fargella, who had also contacted me. Um, and these, um, these two researchers, <clears throat> Gustavo and Vinicius, um, this is a collaboration that has continued on for over 15 years um, at this point. Uh, no, that's that's poor math. That's what, 14, 14 years at this point. Um, so coming from looking at the system in Costa Rica to looking to, at the same system in Brazil, I was struck by two things. First of all, I saw some of the same taxonomic families uh, between the two countries, but I also saw a lot of differences. And this raised some questions. Um, you know, given that these food webs uh, were populated by different species, were they still structured the same way? Um, did the same rules still apply? And more generally, how does biogeography affect ecology? And I guess those early observations of Costa Rica versus Brazil uh, um, we're part of a continuum. Uh, there really is a huge amount of geographic vari variation in the species pool of this aquatic food web. So to, under to answer these questions, um, the only way to answer it really is to start looking everywhere at this one system and comparing how it works in different parts of the world. So to do that, in 2011, we formed the Brominad Working Group. And I found some money to bring 17 people from around the world who I knew were working on this system. I brought them together to Vancouver. Uh, very, uh, I brought, brought them there in the heart of the Canadian winter. So you can see there a whole pile of tropical ecologists uh, trying out snowshoeing for the first time. And we put together a research network, uh, kind of from the ground up. Um, since then, uh, our next meeting was in 2015. It was in Parachi in Brazil. Uh, at that point, we had 45 uh, participants. And then we went on to meetings in uh, Petropolis two years later, and then in France in 2018, 2020, virtual like everybody else. Uh, but we're now over uh, 60 members of the Brominad Working Group. But the story I want to tell you today is how we built uh, this international collaboration. So the first element that we started right away was a lab exchange program for graduate students. Uh, we used loads of different types of funding, but the funding we used to go uh, to have lab exchanges between Canada and Brazil in particular was funded, of course, by the CAPES uh, sandwich program. Uh, but also by a special Canada-Brazil exchange grant that was funded by both countries. We also uh, had uh, sabbatical exchanges, so faculty going back and forth for um, a year at a time. Uh, these are called sabbaticals in Canada and postdocs in Brazil, uh, but they were very effective too. And as part of uh, the live exchange program, we of course had many co-supervised students and postdocs. Um, on the left is a, a list of some of the um, uh, students who were supervised by uh, two uh, different uh, BWG faculty. Um, you know, the nice thing about these uh, co-supervision opportunities is we brought together really different expertises to inform projects. So here's an example of Anna Gonzalez's uh, PhD thesis, um, she studied the effects of ants on Brominiad insects and nutrition. And um, she was co-supervised by Gustavo, who had the background in uh, Brominiads and, and, and nutrition. Um, by me, I brought the aquatic insect component, uh, but also by, by Paolo, um, who brought uh, his expertise on ants. So, um, you know, if you're counting, that's the third Unicampi. Uh, faculty collaboration. Um, the other component we had is 
we cooperated from the start in sharing um, observational data and synthesizing this. And to do this, well, we did a few things. Uh, we built a digital infrastructure. So we created an online SQL relational database uh, that you see at the bottom of your screen with um, uh, 22 field sites and uh, close to 2,000 bromeliads, 900 or so um, invertebrate species. We then built our packages that access this uh, website and synthesize this uh, relational database and synthesize it. So you see FW data and BWG tools as some of our R packages. Uh, we have online identification uh, guides. Um, but perhaps the most important thing we did was um, we spent an entire afternoon, one, one day in Parachi, sitting down as a group and hashing through um, what our expectations were around sharing data. Um, and uh, the, um, the ethics of authorship, uh, the ethics of data ownership, um, and kind of the rules of engagement, uh, which I think has been essential to the longevity of the network. The, because we had this amazing data set that just got better and better and better over the years as we added more and more information, we were able to get funding by international synthesis centers. Um, so CESAB, which is the French synthesis center, uh, funded us for um, a good three years. Uh, then CESAB, which is the German synthesis center, uh, for a further three years. And we're just putting get together an application um, for joint um, uh, uh, French Brazilian uh, synthesis funding. As part of the German uh, Synthesis Center project, um, we uh, really needed uh, some modeling of uh, food web interactions. And so that's how I started collaborating with uh, Matias Pires, who is now making a second uh, appearance in these presentations. Um, and the other thing we did is we started uh, globally distributed experiments or geographically distributed experiments where we replicated the same experiment in multiple parts of the world to ask, um, do we get the same result everywhere? And if we don't, uh, why not? What is driving geographic difference in the ecological responses? So I led one where we uh, manipulated uh, precipitation entering rainfall, entering bromeliads, and looking at the effect on the food webs. Uh, Vinicius led one where um, he drew on his background as a limnologist, uh, thinking about green versus brown sources of carbon in the system in uh, five different sites. Um, Gustavo has also led um, uh, some of these global experiments uh, here, not with bromeliads, but with uh, leaf rolls, insects and leaf rolls, or uh, tree holes. Um, but uh, many of the people who are part of the Bromeliad Working Group have been uh, collaborators on these projects. So this has been a winning strategy for us. Um, we've been very productive as a group. Uh, so since we started the Bromeliad Working Group um, just a decade ago, uh, we've um, published more than 40 uh, multi-institution publications. So where there's multiple BWG universities involved in the publications. Uh, these have often been uh, high visibility publications. Uh, you'll, you'll see there's a number of uh, cover photos that we have there from our work. Um, the one in functional ecology is uh, kind of funny. They almost had to put us on the cover of that particular issue because we ended up uh, just serendipitously um, publishing three different uh, BWG articles in that one issue of functional ecology. And it's also not just productive, but it, it's a huge amount of fun. Um, there's, uh, there's something like a collaboration because, uh, you know, you're, you're excited about the same stuff, you're working together, you're helping each other, you're bouncing ideas off each other, um, and you're relaxing together. Um, so this is part of the social glue that uh, fuels um, 
international collaborations. So my take, you know, that was all that was all fun. But the takeaways, the more serious takeaways that I have from this experience are, first of all, you may have the idea that science is like this incredibly competitive, um, you know, doggy dog kind of uh, environment where everybody's fighting to get their uh, publication into nature and science. Um, well, you could take that view of the world, but uh, if you do collaborative science instead of competitive science, it is much more rewarding, both on a personal level, um, but also in terms of careers. Um, you know, we can talk later, but uh, people who do collaborative science actually uh, do better career-wise in the end. Um, collaboration is not uh, necessarily an easy thing to do. It is something that takes a lot of work. Um, it requires a lot of open dialogue about what the expectations are, about what the process is. It requires the building of trust and the building of relationships, uh, and particularly around policies, around data and authorship. I think um, the important thing for me in uh, collaboration is recognizing that everybody is at the table for a reason. Everybody brings something to the table in the collaboration. And most importantly, everybody should be given the opportunity to bring something to the table. And um, that applies for any collaboration. International collaborations are, of course, no different. Um, so what we want to avoid is um, this idea of parachute science, where somebody from another country parachutes in grabs their data and like uh, zips out again. That's not an international collaboration. So just to finish up the story, I'd taken you most of the way around uh, through all these arrows, but the last arrow I want to tell you about is one that ends with uh, Chiago, who I had met way back in 2008 uh, on Ilia de Codoso. And um, so last year, Chiago had invited me to to give a seminar and he told me before the seminar, he said, you know, there was this point early on in my graduate career where I, I had this discussion with you and um, it was really uh, important in uh, helping shape the direction in, in you know, my thesis. Um, and of course, just like Thomas, uh, you know, several decades earlier, I have no memory of this conversation, even though obviously it was important to Tiago. Um, so we have this idea, I guess, of paying it forward in science. And um, so uh, I, I think I've paid it forward and I look forward to when Tiago plays the same role with um, one of his graduate students. Okay, thanks very much. Look forward to questions. Uh, thank you, Diane, for this wonderful presentation. Uh, I don't deserve your starting words, uh, but I want to make a correction. Like most senior uh, citizens, I have uh, problems rem remembering what we discussed two days ago, but I have a distinct uh, recollection of our talks in Seward uh, 30 years ago. And actually, I can tell you that the main point that I made when you first laid out your ideas for your PhD was uh, you have uh, uh, three wonderful PhD projects, which one of those are you actually going to do? And then you said all three of them. And I said, you're crazy. You can't do that. And of course, you went, to, you went ahead, did them, and did wonderfully. But that's just part of the conversation. I'm, I'm quite sure of that. I was very impressed with your, uh, <clears throat> with the design of the studies, and uh, that's been the case ever since. So, uh, yes, I think that this kind of interchange has has marked a number. I think all all of the collaborations that Wolfgang and and uh, uh, Pedro mentioned. And uh, they range all over, not only Brazil, but other countries as well, as you pointed out. 
So um, I I think that uh, I, I'd like to get back to the main point uh, to, to to my initial question. So this is all very well and good. So we are lovely. We're beautiful. We did one wonderful research, but looking forward, uh, I do want to, to, to ask uh, the three of you again, what do we have to think, not how do we, how do we train people or, or how do we educate them, because that's nonsense, you don't really train people at a graduate level. Uh, you can provide backgrounds and stimulus, and stimulus can be a better toolbox or challenging ideas or challenging them, uh, everybody to come up with their own ideas. I think that's one of the basic things that uh, part of the success of, of uh, uh, our program in Unicamp has been in stimulating people to come up with their own ideas, do their own thing, uh, differently from maybe from what Wolfgang showed us uh, about uh, how Germany looked uh, years ago when he was an undergraduate student when, when university had, uh, had a hair professor who told you what to do and what to, essentially what to think as well. So I think that one of the things that Wolfgang enjoyed in Brazil is that uh, creative anarchy or less regard for authority or whatever and I hope that this keeps on being one of the features of Brazilian ecology, that we should hear and not to have too, too much respect for, for, for professors. Given that, my question is, how can we um, help prepare people for the future? And I mentioned a toolbox, for instance, uh, metagenomics should current students have a working knowledge in order that they can assess whether they can incorporate this into what they're going to do later on, or does it, I, I keep remembering uh, Ramon Margalef's introduction to the first, to the French edition of the numerical ecology book that I think that disappeared from the English edition. And he said, he complimented the Legendres on writing a wonderful book. And he said, at the time when he was a young student, he learned mathematics as people learned about, uh, as uh, boys learned about sex in Spain at the time, which is in the street and haphazardly. So how do we keep students from having to learn to figure out on their own what could be useful to, to, to them in five years or ten years. That's one, just one aspect that I would like to you to, to ask you to comment on. Okay, I, I, will, I will bite. Um, so ecology um, is driven both by concepts and by methods. So I guess the question that you are getting at, Thomas, is how do we make sure that um, uh, everybody is being trained on these cutting edge methods? Um, so I actually think Brazil is doing a really good job here. Um, and I, you know, I don't, I don't work a lot with metagenomics, um, but I'll take it, I'll take the analogy of uh, something else I work a lot with, which is data science. So most of my work is kind of on the edge of ecology and data science. Um, so um, I actually think uh, that my Brazilian uh, graduate students are completely on par with my Canadian graduate students in terms of data science. Um, uh, that there is no uh, 
gap here uh, in um, in the methods. Um, Okay, so <clears throat> I don't know if Pedro was going to add on this. I he opened and closed his microphone. Yeah, yeah, sure. Uh, sorry, because I lost your your last comment, uh, Thomas. You you were muted, and um, yes, I, I I totally agree with Diane. To me, the 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 most crucial point is, is not to abandon fundamental ecological research and. What I mean by fundamental ecological research? Uh, to me, fundamental ecological research is the one that is uh, question driven, but solidly based on empirical ecology, on natural history details. So what I try to avoid is to having these natural history details as a trap, where you get trapped in all those details and then you function like a reductionist and you are completely unable to escape from, from the media of, of except, uh, exceptions that we see in nature against any general process that we might infer. And natural history detail is, I, I like it very much, your mention of the, of the introduction of the numerical uh, ecology numérique uh, uh, book by the Legendres, uh, by Ramon Margalef, because Ramon Margalef ma mainstream uh, research was solidly based in, in natural history. So not forgetting that, we need to put the students also in having an expert knowledge of the different tools that are uh, available. And then all those tools are also a trap in, the, in themselves. Well, can be a trap. I mean, you can get trapped in, in metagenomics, you can get trapped in statistics, you can get trapped in multivariate analysis, you can get trapped in Bayesian inference, I mean, in, in, in phylogenetic analysis, if you forget your organisms, as, as, as Robert McCarthy would say, you need, to, you need to know your species, you need to know your organism. But then on top of that, we need to provide the students with the, with the solid knowledge of the tools. And to me, that is one lesson that I've learned in Brazil. Uh, and Wolf, Wolfgang already mentioned that. The role model that the different graduate programs and, and postgraduate programs in Brazil have in terms of combining these field expertise with more theoretical, more methodological driving aspects, more esoteric, if you want to if you want to say aspect in, in ecological research. So to me, that would be the key aspect. Yeah, I, I would like to add um, that I do think it's important that students today learn in some depth also, like from the research front in, in those methods. So the microbiome research, the the, re, the yeah, the, the role that um, microbes play at the root soil interface for plant insect interactions. Yeah, or the role. Uh, so basically the role of, of bacteria and fungi in taking over some functions for the higher organisms or um, chemical ecology and the molecular basis of chemical ecology for interspecific interaction. There's a lot of expensive um, research happening. And, um, and and this is actually also true for Germany. You have to provide students with some insight. Uh, and um, this is this is sometimes difficult for a single university. So maybe, maybe um, it would be good if these ecology programs can actually combine and make such courses available for everybody if you have expertise scattered over all or several universities. Um, I, I think that, um, yeah, you, you must know about um, all the techniques and um, and not just in a very theoretical way, but maybe a practical even where you do chemical ecology or where you do microbiome research or where you 
um, yeah, whatever uh, other meta barcoding is also um, uh, there's also a research front that that um, where we're not yet uh, there that this is a standard method. So so I, I do think that um, that this may only be possible through collaboration, but I think it's very important. Well, uh, I, I threw in metagenomics kind of because I kind of expected to provoke all of you, uh, be, uh, kind of channeling towards uh, one point, which I think that you made with different words, that it's all well and fine to learn new tricks or new tools, but you have to have underlying questions. You know, what Pedro said, especially how Pedro stressed it, that uh, what he called a trap, that, that there is a risk that you get to train yourself to become an expert driver of multivariate analysis or genomic analysis or whatever, and lose track of the underlying questions, of the basic questions. So I think that this combination that you are encouraging is something that, that we should keep in mind also what Wolfgang just said about uh, some expensive and difficult uh, cutting edge research that the sensible thing is to uh, to get consortia and try to bring students together and in what in workshop or uh, advanced science schools in which they have the opportunity to do hands-on work learn tricks uh, I used to 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 tell people that uh, with new with new methods uh, at the time it was multivariate analysis that my, my, my initial goals were to um, show students first to what it's what it can be used for a second to uh, not be afraid of using it but third to learn to respect how to do it properly so it's not uh, uh, it's a combination of things of uh, learning and incorporating new new methods and i think there are a number of of uh, new uh, frontiers that we are on the verge of that we see that are starting off Wolf can mentioned a few others and uh, i would like to bring this back to something which i think that in a way especially all of you have expertise in which is a uh, larger scale of cooperative experiments or cooperative field studies, either manu manipulative or uh, just organized, standardized observations, long-term observations, which can be collated uh, across different habitats, geographical regions, or biomes. Uh, I would like you to, to, to comment because on this, how essential this is, because I think this is one particular uh, question uh, or area in which we could do a lot more than we are doing at present in Brazil. And uh, so uh, study systems that, uh, as the Yen experiment that Wolfgang led for many years or uh, Diane's studies, which she briefly touched on in her presentation, and Pedro's studies across, also across different biomes, uh, all of these, I think, uh, are models for opportunities that we could develop much, much further within Brazil and across boundaries. I mean, Brazil is so extensive that my feeling is that there's a lot that we could do if we could do comparative research across biomes, for instance. So if you'd like to comment on that, I'd be very happy. Yeah, sure. I, 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 that, that is absolutely important and, and even essential. It is extremely urgent that we organize all those type of, of, of massive compilation of information. There, there, is, there is a vast amount of information about natural systems that need to be compiled. And there is much added value on compiling that information as, for instance, the initiative that Diane mentioned around the, 
the bromeliads and the fascinating food webs that they that they harbor and, and other initiatives. For instance, yesterday Ecology published the one of the data paper, the last data paper of the Atlantic series is the Atlantic pollination with a with a fascinating, it's, it's really amazing a compilation of data of uh, a pollination of, of plants by vertebrates in in the in the Atlantic forest. And it's a, it's a several years effort of a very large group of people, and those efforts are fundamental. And, and, and I think that Diane has very elegantly put the essential aspects of uh, this information. Is that every author, every 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 person contributing to those papers needs to receive proper citation, proper an acknowledgement of their efforts, and 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 uh, any uh, subsequent uh, analysis by uh, big data people, by modeling people, should give proper credits to all those efforts of compilation efforts, because otherwise we are completely lost. We are witnessing in different countries that field ecological research is decreasing in interest among students. The students of uh, mainstream ec ec ecology are turning progressively to more data-oriented uh, quantitative analysis, uh, modeling techniques and all that. And, and Experimental field ecology is 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 progressively abandoned. It, I'm I'm seeing this uh, everywhere. It, it, it's not a particular problem in a particular country, but everywhere it, is um, my opinion on that. But yes, I totally agree that all those uh, big data approaches are, are are fundamental. Absolutely. Yeah, I'd echo that. I mean, I think the future of ecology is 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 big, right? We, um, you know, we had this paradox that the questions that we want to answer is we want to know the general answer, and the only way to get a general answer is to ask the same question in many places. Um, you know, that's the the paradox is we we can't do like massive experiments at those sorts of scales, but what we can do are these geographically replicated experiments. Um, and we can build networks uh, to do those. Um, and we can also um, do really uh, um, interesting data analyses that we've never been able to do before um, by collating some of these large data sets. And the, the, the Amazonian uh, data sets are, are, um, uh, are, are uh, you know, a really rich, uh, um, source of data for some of these. Um, so uh, some of the ways you can do these are, um, for example, I mentioned uh, synthesis centers. Um, so Brazil uh, has Symbiose that um, uh, started uh, just a few years ago. Um, there are also a network of synthesis centers around the world who uh, are very happy to fund uh, researchers from other countries, including um, Brazil. So these are all kind of rich opportunities uh, for funding for these sorts of initiatives. Thanks, uh, Wolfgang. Would you care to throw in a comment on large scale comparisons and experiments? Yeah, um, well, I can basically only repeat what has been said. I think um, we have made in Germany a good experience with bringing people together, working on the same plots. And I think that is something that um, we should certainly do across the world. There's now more and more, uh, yeah, this approach is now used more and more that you do the same experiment all over the world. And of course, Brazil should and does contribute to this. But also doing something within Brazil only would probably be a very good idea that you can bundle the competences um, that you have in different universities. So maybe that's something that is maybe not quite so prominent yet due to uh, not specific funding themes for this, but maybe that's something very interesting. And then, of course, you can exploit 
particular strength you have. One thing that actually comes to my mind is that you have the unique opportunity in contrast to us, I would think, at least to Germany, that you still have some more or less pristine environments or rarely or not so much disturbed. You have very good fragments. And then you have already uh, converted areas. And so far, as far as I can see, Brazilian ecology has concentrated on research in these pristine environments. Of course, this is much more interesting um, biologically. But you haven't really um, um, sort of, I think, fully exploited um, this, uh, looking at this mosaic of land used by humans and the more pristine to, to understand the role of the matrix and what species can live uh, outside and how we, how sustainable land use actually uh, can, can look like or more sustainable. Like in Germany, we have the problem that all our reference sites are really very bad sites. So we often, for example, find that like a managed forest is not so much different from an, an unmanaged um, preserved forest. But this is not because the managed forest is so rich, but it's because the unmanaged forest is so poor because uh, it has been used for centuries. So I, I think uh, you have the unique position that you have this real reference point and can say much more than in other countries about the real loss of diversity and uh, where the challenges are um, and where maybe also where some hope is. So thanks, Wolfgang. I must say I've been watching the, the YouTube uh, stream. We got a large number of compliments on the talks, and uh, many people enjoyed this. And hopefully, if this, as I think it will, uh, is still available on YouTube afterwards, I, I think that a number of people who were invited but had other things to do this is mid-afternoon in Brazil and people are busy, that this will be enjoyed and uh, will be, uh, <clears throat> I think, have further, uh, foster further discussion and, and uh, reverberations. I would like to, in, in, in my closing, in closing this, this, this round table, to come back to one point that Diane made, which I think is hugely important, that. Uh, uh, collaborative science is is more fun and more effective in even in promoting individual careers. I think this is an, a really important point to make when uh, we are um, encouraged to compete for uh, funds and compete for a uh, 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 struggling for diminishing funds and compete for rankings and so on. I think that uh, given the current situation, not only in Brazil, but particularly in Brazil, we could do very well or by uh, trying to set up consortia for particular things, including possibly for uh, for field courses in, in order to, to obtain uh, possibly uh, uh, international support for a few courses in Brazil and then bring in students from overseas as well. So these are just some possibilities that I think should be deserve a uh, discussion in the future. And I'm sure that these discussions will include all, all three of you. I would like to thank uh, you immensely for your your talks. I think they were stimulating. I think we got maybe more uh, compliments than we deserve, but we enjoyed them anyway. And uh, uh, I would like to close by inviting everyone, including the three of you, to the next roundtable, which will be on Monday at the same time, and it will focus on conservation, which of course is one of the hottest, unfortunately that is a very bad joke, one of the hottest themes in Brazil nowadays. So thank you all, and uh, please uh, be back next Monday for our, our next roundtable, which will 
uh, feature a number of alumni and alumni from, from uh, Unicamp discussing this subject. So goodbye and uh, <coughs> till the next time then. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Thomas. Thank you. Goodbye. Very much. Bye. Bye, Wolfgang. Bye, Diane. Bye-bye.